Good morning, everyone. A real warm welcome to you. Um, I don't, not sure what you did with all your friends. Uh, <laughs> I think they must have, they must all be on holiday. It's only us that no, haven't got. Oh, that's <laughs> it. Yeah. Well, it's great to be together, nevertheless. And uh, you know, the most important thing is that uh, when we gather together, uh, God is with us, and. Um, 
And the exciting thing about this morning is that we have an opportunity to sing praise to his name. We have an opportunity to speak to him in prayer. And we have an opportunity to hear from him and his word. And that's why we gather together. I want to start our service just by reading a little bit of an ex extended little uh, section from Zechariah. And uh, Richard's going to be preaching to us uh, from John 12. Um, and uh, John quotes Zechariah 9. So hear these words from Zechariah 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace to the nations, and he shall rule from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. The Lord will save his people. Then the Lord will appear over them, and the Lord of hosts will protect them. And on that day, the Lord will, be, will save them as a flock of his people. For, they, for like the jewel of a crown, they shall shine on his land. And it's a great picture of, of what God has done and, and what he was going to do in, through the work of Jesus on the cross. And in prepping for this, um, it always amazes me as to how God actually puts certain things in my way as I'm thinking about preparing for a service. And I was listening to a podcast and, uh, from Living Waters, and they were talking about the cross. And they just said that the cross is the place where justice, grace, and mercy meet. And the cross is where our sins are forgiven through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, but where we receive grace. Grace is, is us getting what we didn't deserve. And then mercy, us not getting what we did deserve. So... In response to this, mercy from the Lord Jesus Christ, the only real response is to stand and sing, how great is our God and my Savior, my God. Let us stand and sing.
seated. What a great God. And just imagine having lined those uh, roads, singing praise and shouting glory to God that, um, that the people in Jerusalem must have experienced that day. But we're going to come to a time of prayer. I'm going to lead us in a prayer of praise just to say thank you to God for what he's done for us on the cross. Gracious and merciful for God, we humble ourselves before you by the magnitude of your love displayed on the cross. We, the Lord Jesus Christ bore the weight of our sins. And in the shadow of that cross, we acknowledge the depth of our own brokenness. As is described in, in Titus, we were once foolish and disobedient, led astray slaves to various passions and pleasures. We hate by others and we were hating one another yet in your boundless mercy you saved us not because of our righteous deeds but but according to your mercy by the washing of the regeneration and the renewal by the Holy Spirit whom you poured out on us so richly through the Lord Jesus Christ so that being justified by your grace we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life and in the midst of our struggles and our trials, we, we want to fix our eyes on the living hope, the Lord Jesus. And in 1 Peter, we're reminded that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because again, according to your great mercy, you've caused us to be born again into a living hope. Through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading and kept in heaven for us. Though we may suffer various trials now, these trials refine our faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. 
because we are precious in your sight. And you, O oh God, are our king, as proclaimed in Zechariah. You came to us humbled and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, bringing salvation to all who would call upon your name. You declared freedom to the prisoners and poured out your blood to the ransom us from death. You are our stronghold and our refuge in times of trouble. And you've restored us and promised us a future overflowing with blessing. Your blood shed on the cross. Seal the covenant of your everlasting love. And so we say, how great is our God, how great indeed. And we stand in awe of your majesty, overwhelmed by your grace, and filled with gratitude for your mercy. And we pray that our lives would be a testimony a testimony to your goodness, and may our obedience be a reflection of your love. And our praise is a symphony of thanksgiving to you. Amen. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer of confession, and uh, this prayer of confession I'm going to do in two parts, so the next time I lead, you will hear the second part. But it's a, it's a prayer of confession that I want us to participate in, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to also be part of this prayer of confession, and I've used the, the Ten Commandments as the framework for this um, prayer of confession. So after each commandment, I'm going to pray something, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to speak to God and to confess your sin before Almighty God. So let us pray. Lord, as we come before you in this moment of confession corporately, and individually, we acknowledge the weight of our own transgressions against your commandments. And you've given us your commandments as a guide for, for righteous living. But your commandments have also enabled us to see our sin and our need for a saviour. And we thank you for opening our eyes to this. And so we acknowledge that we have fallen short in thought and in word and in deed. And you said that you shall have no other gods before me. And so we pray, forgive us, Lord, for the times that we have placed our desires and our ambitions and our idols above you, neglecting the centrality of your, your presence in our lives. And help us to worship you and you alone with undivided hearts. Speak to God in your heart now. You also said you shall not make for yourself an idol. Yet, Lord, we do. Forgive us. Forgive us for fashioning idols of, of wealth, of success, of fame, or even ourselves. And grant us the humility to recognize that the true fulfillment comes from serving you and you alone. Confess before God. And you said, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And so forgive us, Lord, for the times that we have used your name carelessly or invoked it to justify our own agendas. May our words honor your holy name and reflect the reverence due to you. Speak to the Lord now. And you said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And forgive us, Lord, for neglecting the sacred rhythm of rest and worship. Teach us to find renewal and strength in setting aside time to commune with you and to honor your Sabbath. Now, Lord, we do pray that... Uh, that our confessions might not be merely us going through the motions, but a heartfelt recognition of our need for your grace and your mercy. And grant us the humility to mourn over our sins and the, the meekness to hunger and thirst for righteousness and the purity of heart to seek your forgiveness and restoration. 
And Lord, as we look up and see the cross, and we see your death, and we see your resurrection, we may know and appropriate the forgiveness of our sins through that. And so thank you that we, are stand, we do stand here forgiven today, not because of what we've done, but because of your great love that you displayed for us, and you took the wrath of God on that cross. And in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome again. Um, Sean's away for the weekend, and uh, it's our delight in, in that regard to welcome Richard here this morning as our preacher, and we look forward to you bringing us God's word, Richard. Thank you very much for that. Um, just a few announcements. Uh, uh, for, yeah, there it is. <laughs> Get a little bit twitchy here. <laughs> so a few birthdays. Remember, there's tea and coffee afterwards, so don't rush off. Let's fellowship. Let's uh, catch up with one another, encourage each other uh, over a cup of coffee. Now, another way to encourage each other is uh, through contacting people whose birthdays it is this week. So there are quite a few birthdays on Tuesday for John Adams, Jonah, and Nelly. On Wednesday is Philip, and uh, we hope that you guys have a wonderful day. For Beverly Hogan on Thursday and Daryl Wells on, on, on Friday. And uh, don't forget there's a love um, box at the back and a thank offering box at the back as you leave um, to, for you to support the ministry here at Christchurch George or through then EFT in straight into the bank account details. So the bank account details are on the board at the back. There are a few dates to Daryl's and Josh is going to speak to some of that now. Morning, everyone. Morning. One of the, the many things I've come to enjoy when moving to George are the thunderstorms. But I feel like it reveals two kinds of people. Those that want to stand on their stoop or on their balcony or even in their garden and like embrace the thunderstorm, like feel it to their core. If that's you, raise your hand. Yeah, good. But then there's other kind of person that wants to close the blinds, close the curtains, close the windows in case the lightning comes through the windows and into the house. That person's my wife. So it was an interesting <laughs> evening last night. Um, but uh, something that's more electrifying and more glorious is the entrance of King Jesus. And we celebrate that today as Palm Sunday. But today also marks the start of Easter week, um, where we come to celebrate and devote and reflect on the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is the most significant moment in, in history. And it is at the center of the Christian faith, and it's something that we build our faith on, um, and it is the, mo the one event that determines eternity for those that trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So as we approach this Easter week, uh, we invite you to join in on this, on this journey together of Easter, of faith and reflection, of praise and resurrection, and as a church family here at George, we, we center around knowing Christ, growing in Christ, and overflowing in Christ in, the, in our lives together in our community. So this Easter, we invite you to, to join us as we follow the journey to the cross together. And may this journey leave us with a deeper and more personal knowledge of Jesus Christ that leads to growth in our faith and in him. And may this in turn overflow into our lives and into our community. So I urge you to not waste this Easter. Do not let it fly by as a long weekend and a good rest, even though Christ invites us to find rest in him. But come to Christ, see his life, his sacrifice, sees glory, sees love, and sees grace for you this Easter. And we're going to do that by meeting together a couple of times this week and celebrating together. Um, but we're also going to meet together in prayer and devotion and reflection. There are way too many papers on this pulpit. <laughs> and that's going to happen on Tuesday. There might be a notice, Andrew. I don't think it's there this week, but yeah, it's not Andrew's fault, don't worry. Um, on Tuesday to Thursday morning, 7 a.m. to 7.30, followed by coffee, so don't feel like you need to rush off, off afterwards. But there will be a morning uh, of Easter devotions. We'll be meeting around God's Word together, praying together, and really reflecting on, on the week of Easter and the events of Easter, um, followed by some fellowship afterwards. Um, on Wednesday evening, the band will be leading us in um, praise and worship as we sing quite a few songs um, and, and go through the Easter story together. 
And I really urge you to come together to meet as a community as we pray, as we praise God together for, for what he's done um, through Jesus this Easter. And we're going to be followed by, that will be followed by a bring and share supper. So please don't forget to bring something along if you are able. And then on Friday is Good Friday. We'll have a Holy Communion service. Remember, this is a combined service. So only at 9 a.m. Will, will that service um, be held. And then on Sunday is Easter Sunday. Um, we'll be meeting at 9 a.m., also a combined service. And they will be sharing hot cross buns. So bring those along. I'm not sure how much you like raisins or how you feel about hot cross buns. I'm not such a big fan. But bring it along nonetheless. We eat them anyway. Um, so, yeah. Encourage you to share the, 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 the invite on the WhatsApp group. Um, it's on there if you want to share it with friends and family. I'll post something again on Monday. Um, but really invite others and let them be part of this, this journey together. Um, and may we all come out of it with a deeper knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and a deeper relationship with him. And may that in turn overflow into the rest of our lives as we come out of Easter. Thank you. <laughs> a game again, okay, a remembering game. So you get 30 seconds to look at this, okay? <laughs> and then I'm going to get you to close your eyes and I'll take one away. You guys just all remember which one it is. One more seconds. I've already forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to take one away. <laughs> Which one is gone? You can shout it out. The thing. Young brains. Something blue. Something blue, yes. The blue battery. Well done. Oh, Give them a hand. You need it too, hey? There you go. Okay, let's play another round. Give you 10 seconds quickly. Can you take the matchbox away next time? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Hmm. I'll take away. Matchbox. This one. <laughs> I can promise you it is not the matchbox. <laughs> nail clipper. Nail clipper. Who said that? Well done. Very quick. Very good. Yes, the nail clipper. Okay, last round. Last round. Hmm. Let's see if we can find a difficult one. Okay. It wasn't, this is not a native, but maybe, maybe it was a bit far. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Uh, staples. Staples. Well done. Very yeah. good, everybody. Give yourself a hand. <laughs> So in today's lesson at Kids Church, we're actually a little bit ahead of what the Easter program is about. We're going to be looking at the Last Supper at Kids Church, which is also about Jesus saying to the disciples that they need to remember something. And the kids are going to find out what are we going to need to remember and why do we need to remember that. So that's why we played a little remembrance game. So kids, you guys can come with me to Kids Church and you guys can ask them afterwards, why do we need to remember these things? Why is that so important? Okay, let's go. Please stand as we sing uh, Servant King. <clears throat> Oh,
Just uh, a few petition items that we're going to bring before him, most notably for us as individuals to use this time of Easter as an opportunity to share the gospel, because it is a great opportunity that we should not let go by. And to pray for the Journey to the Cross series that, of this week. Um, so let us pray. Our oh, Heavenly Father, we, we come before you this morning to ask that you would help us not to allow Easter, this long weekend that lies ahead, to be another holiday, another time of our lives, a time for Easter eggs and time with family, but rather that it would be a time of serious reflection on who Christ is and what he did for us. We pray that we would use this opportunity, this opportunity to share the incredible good news of the gospel of Christ. Help us to be bold and courageous, wise and compassionate with our friends and family, that we'd find opportunities, that we would pray for opportunities to share God's grace and mercy with them. And so we pray and we commend our program to you for this coming week. We pray for the morning uh, devotions, for the evening of, of praise and worship, for the Good Friday communion service and Easter Se Sunday celebration service. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in each of these events, that people would come to know you better and that those that do not know you would come to know you. And Lord, we too, we want to pray for our church and because we know that you govern all things in heaven and on earth. And it's in your mercy that you do this. And so we pray for Christ Church, George, and we, we pray that you'd grant to this church and, and all churches that preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. May you strengthen and encourage the faithful. Would you protect and guide the children and relieve the sick and the afflicted. And we pray that through the witness of Christ, George, here in George, we would 
turn and soften the unrepentant. We are to awaken the careless and recover those that have drifted from the faith. Lord, we commend to you Sean and Nesta and Josh, our council and all those in leadership positions, to remain rooted and grounded in your word, that would be strengthened and equipped to lead and to serve this body of believers. We commend to you our building project. We commend to you those who are involved in its daily planning and activities. We pray that you would prosper this project. We pray that you would go before it and, and remove any obstacle that lands in its way, if it be your will. We too want to pray for those hurting and in need, because you're the comforter of the sad and, and the strength to those who suffer. So let the prayers of your children who cry out in trial come to you. And those that are distressed, grant them mercy, relief, and restoration. Lord, we pray for our great country, our beautiful country. We pray for our president, for the cabinet, for premiers, for mayors and councillors, those that are responsible for leading and serving. Grant them compassion for your people. Grant them wisdom. Grant them a desire to serve. And as we, the citizens of this country, prepare to vote, May we be responsible in our preparation. May we cast our vote responsibly. And for the many countries around the world that are also facing elections, may your will be done. As we are confident in your providence and in your love, and we know that you cause nations and leaders to rise and to fall, and when we look back at all, it is only then that we sometimes are able to see your hand of mercy on our world. But we know and rest in your providence. We too want to just pray for, for the loss of innocent lives and for the destruction of homes and communities and cities by dreadful wars being fought around the world today. Also for the unreported violence against believers in many parts of Africa and in other nations of this world. We commend our brothers to you and ask for justice to come to those who commit these atrocities. You know, Lord, we, we simply plead with you to return. Come, Lord Jesus, come. But we know that every day you delay is an opportunity for more to turn to faith in you. So we thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy. Amen. Amen. Please, would you open up your Bibles to John chapter 12? Adele's going to read to us. The Bible reading can be found on page 124 in the Supplied Bible, John 12, reading from verse 12 to 19. The next day, the crowd, the great crowd that had come for the feast, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This is God's word. Thank you so much for that warm welcome and the invitation to come and share with you. I love coming here. You guys are such a blessing. Uh, 
అమ్మాంట్లా Did I get the wrong venue? <laughs> Or perhaps in the context of today's reading, Hosanna, King of Israel. Have you noticed how we live in an age of protest? South Africans are just like really good at it. We live in an age where various people groups, especially Christians, want their own way. nationalism including what's been called christian nationalism it's on the rise it's increasing and we live in an era that's increasingly hostile to christian values as well because we live in a post christian culture and nobody likes to be oppressed which is why freedom songs and slogans are so rousing and inspiring for a movement they represent a call to hope a, a call to action songs like hosanna which means save us it comes from psalm 118 verse 25 and 26 it says save us we pray o lord o lord we pray give us success blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord we bless you from the house of the lord symbols are powerful for liberation movements as well whether it be that clenched fist or a special flag or palm branches palm branches represented nationalism and you would find them on coins jewish coins had palm branches representing jewish nationalism the romans also had palm branches on their coins representing roman nationalism and two centuries before jesus walked into jerusalem or sorry rode the donkey into jerusalem the maccabean revolt had taken place this revolt was against the syrian governor and tyrant antiochus at this point the greeks were in charge and they were imposing their hellenism on all the nations but antiochus just had a thing for the jews and he really targeted them and he banned all jewish practices you know just standard things like observing the sabbath and the festivals and and reading the law and the sacrifices and circumcision but when he desecrated the temple by turning it into a place to to worship zeus that was way too much and it resulted in an uprising which became known as the maccabean revolt cut a long story short the guerrilla warfare uprising resulted in the jews regaining their freedom to worship and in 164 bc they rededicated the temple and a fact which is actually celebrated to this day in the feast of hanukkah there was relative peace and stability in the land until the romans came along in 63 bc around about 100 years later and as we know the oppression started all over again but when the maccabean revolt resulted in their victory palm branches were waved as a symbol of their victory and their national identity which incidentally makes it really cool that it, after this triumphal entry in the very next passage we have greeks seeking jesus and i love it that it's in that context that jesus says now the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified and it leads into this whole conversation by jesus of his upcoming death but back to jerusalem to that day it's passover the city and the surrounding villages are packed it was the desire of every jew if they lived in a foreign land to do at least one passover in Jerusalem and passover just had a knack for raising revolutionary leaders and so the romans would bring in extra soldiers for reinforcement i don't want to overstate the case but there were certainly thousands of visitors and jerusalem and in the surrounding areas was kind of just packed to capacity it's jerusalem it's passover time which you know is a feast about liberation 
National fever is high because you're seeing all the Romans and the Jews are so hungry for a liberator. They are so hungry for that promised Messiah who would cast off the oppressive yoke of the Romans and send them packing. And Jesus is a really good candidate. I mean, he's got miracle powers. He can raise people from the dead so you don't have to worry about loss of soldiers. And he can feed thousands on just a small lunch and still have food left over. It's a socialist dream. And the people hear that Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. And so they're shouting, save us, O King of Israel. Give us the triumphant victory. And they're waving the branches and they're laying down the cloths. But you know the thing about crowds, it doesn't take much to get them going, does it? Not at all. There's a reason why, if you look in Luke's version, Luke 19, verse 39, the Pharisees are freaked out. They're telling Jesus, listen, tell your disciples to keep quiet. And what was Jesus' response? Listen, if they don't keep quiet, the, the stones are going to cry out. But here's a question for you. If you were in that crowd that day, what would your palm branch have represented? Would it have been simply a fun thing to do because you know, hey, the crowd's having a vibe, the vibes are amazing, and you're a curious onlooker and you want to know what the fuss is all about, so you're joining in and waving the palm branch. I remember once at Varsity, a fellow student says to me, hey, are you joining in the protest this afternoon? I'm like, well, what are we protesting? No, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Perhaps your palm branch might have been political, like most of the people there. You know, looking to this Jesus as your political hope to set your people free from the Roman oppressors. Or perhaps, and I like to think this would be more us, the next two examples, would have been a Leviticus 23 verse 40 palm branch. Using it as a symbol of rejoicing, like you would in the Feast of Tabernacles, because Jesus is worth rejoicing about. Jesus didn't deny the praise. The people might have got it wrong, but the praise was accurate. And let me just read that to you, Leviticus 23, 40. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of the splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. Or perhaps our palm branches may have been a prophetic Palm branch. I just want to read to you Revelation 7, verse 9 to 11. This is so cool. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. How amazing is that? But make no mistake, there was a clear clash of expectations that day on that Palm Sunday. The crowds did want a political liberator, the atmosphere was charged. If ever there was a moment where Jesus could declare who and what he was, this was it. And he did. <laughs> but in a totally different way to the expectations of the crowd. Because Jesus had a different agenda. And it's all the more significant when you consider how throughout the ministry of Jesus, Jesus kept telling people not to reveal who he was. And now he's letting you know who he is. He's making it so clear. He's going to reveal who he truly is by riding on a donkey. Let's have a look at that donkey. Three things I want to highlight about Jesus riding a donkey into Jerusalem. It was distinctive, destiny, and deadly. And there's my subtle Baptist influence coming through there. 
Firstly, it was distinctive. It was distinctive because Jesus didn't come riding in like other kings. Royalty did ride on donkeys, but not into war. <laughs> to ride a donkey was to come in peace. Even in Old Testament law, the kings were banned from having lots of horses. You can check that out in Deuteronomy 17 verse 16. Because it turns out that their kingship was to be distinctive. Not to trust in chariots and horses, but in God. Psalm 20 verse 7. Interestingly enough, one of Solomon's sins wasn't just all the wives. It was the fact that he had so many chariots and horses. But Jesus didn't come riding in roughshod over the people or even the enemies. He didn't come in pandering to peer pressure. He didn't come in flaunting his muscle or his army. But he did come in declaring his distinctive identity. I am the King of Israel. I am the promised Messiah. And my kingdom is distinctly different from any worldly kingdom. Just listen to the broader context of those verses from Psalm 118. Psalm 118, I'm going to read from verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has made his light to shine upon us. Listen to this. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. That is amazing. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. I give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And our brother read from Zechariah earlier on. Thank you so much. I'm just going to read then verse 9 and 10, the immediate context. So Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bows shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Did you hear that? Jesus shall speak peace to the nations. His message is reinforced by his visual aid. Jesus, the true king of Israel, enters Jerusalem on a donkey, which incidentally didn't even belong to him. <laughs> it was, however, a donkey that was set aside for him. A holy donkey, if you will. It had never been ridden, which technically meant, in my understanding, it should have like bucked a bit. But you know, it's the donkey's creator riding it. And into a context that's going to prove hostile to him, a lamb going into the wolf's den, we see the peace of Jerusalem riding on an animal of peace. And that challenges me. Because I get the impression that many within our Christian family want to ride the war horse. <laughs> We're going to fight all the evils that threaten us. We're known more for taking sides than we are for loving our neighbor and for sharing the gospel and bringing the path of reconciliation between God and man. And I'm just going to back that up. You know how in Romans 12 verse 3 it says... For by the grace given to me, I'll say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, 
but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each one of you. Folks, I suspect we might need some faith adjustment. It was interesting, there was a poll done in the USA by the Episcopal Church, and it showed a significant gap between the self-perception of Christians and how outsiders perceived them. So this is how evangelical Christians characterize themselves in this poll. 72% said that Christians were loving. 71% said that they were compassionate. And 71% said that Christians, Christians said that they were giving. And 62% of them said that they were respectful. But those who had no religious affiliation at all whatsoever painted a slightly different picture. 55% said that Christians were hypocritical. 54% said that Christians were judgmental. And 50% said that Christians were self-righteous. Ouch. Now, believe me, I understand the desire to ride a war horse. And we know that one day Jesus will indeed return on a war horse. Revelation 19.11, the rider is faithful and true. But I cannot help but think, folks, that until that day, we're called to ride a donkey. <laughs> to be known as people who pursue the path of peace in the context of cultural hostility and misunderstanding, even though it may cost us our lives. Because a distinctive king needs to be represented by distinctive disciples. That's always been the calling of God's people. Malachi 3, 16 to 18. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more, you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Remember Peter's letter? What did he say? I know you know it, 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The donkey disciple will prioritize the path of peace and the praise of God over any personal preferences. But riding on the donkey was also destiny for Jesus. Jesus was fulfilling prophecy. And that speaks into, firstly, how Jesus was sovereign over the event. And secondly, how he was obedient to the will of the Father. This is a God-orchestrated event, an event prophesied hundreds of years before. This is a God-orchestrated event announcing who Jesus was. This was a God-ordained event revealing the mission of Jesus. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Just in case you weren't aware, the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday as we call it, was Lamb Selection Day for the Passover. That's the lamb, the day you chose the lamb that you were going to sacrifice. It had to be male without defect and mature. Wow. But in riding on a donkey in fulfillment of prophecy, we also see that this is a God-obeying event. Jesus reminds us that he is here in obedience to the Father, to do the will of the Father. There in verse 14, and Jesus found a donkey and sat on it just as it is written. Or in Matthew's account in 21, Matthew 21 verse 4, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophets. Jesus defined his life by his obedience to the Father. John 4, 34, he just simply says, my food says Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Remember that agonizing prayer in Gethsemane. Father, if it be possible, take this cup away. 
yet not my will, but yours be done. So in a word, Jesus surrendered to the sovereign will of the Father God through his obedience. That's how Jesus fulfilled his destiny. The writer to the Hebrews puts it like this, Hebrews 5 verse 7 to 9, I always find this challenging, says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because he was the son of God. And that's his identity. No, that's not what it tells us. He was heard because of his reverence. That blows me away. He was heard because of his reverence to his father. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And folks, that's how a donkey disciples fulfills their destiny too, surrendering to the sovereign will of God through obedience. Because an obedient donkey goes where the rider tells it to go. Of course, riding the donkey into Jerusalem that day, announcing his kingship was also deadly. Jesus was effectively signing his death warrant. (laughs) Jesus was walking into what he repeatedly told his disciples that he had to walk into. Throughout this ministry, Jesus told his disciples they were going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to be handed over to the Pharisees and to the Gentiles, and he would be flogged and he would be crucified, but that he would rise again. But they didn't get it. Notice in verse 16, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Only after Jesus was glorified did the disciples put two and two together. Take note that this triumphal entry immediately follows the episode of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead and how the Pharisees also wanted to kill Lazarus. I mean, the poor guy, he gets raised from the dead and now the Pharisees want to kill him. Um, <laughs> Actually, let's just read it. Just look at verse 9 there. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. And then just take note of the exasperation of the Pharisees in verse 19. That they said to one another, you see, you're gaining nothing. The whole world's gone after him. They were being prophetic and they didn't even realize it. <laughs> but it just added to their motivation of getting rid of Jesus. But riding into Jerusalem on a donkey that day revealed that Jesus had orientated his life to his death. He knew Good Friday was coming. He didn't back down. Jesus was going to set the example of laying down his life so that others may find it. Let's jump ahead to verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and it dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. You know, it's interesting, later on in John chapter 13, let's actually just go there, um, when Jesus predicts the denial of Peter, Peter is adamant that he would lay down his life for Jesus. Uh, Verse 37 of chapter 13. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, and as I read this, just imagine that Jesus is sitting next to you. Perhaps you've got your head on his shoulder, and he whispers in your ear, will you lay down your life for me? It's interesting, the word here for life isn't biological life. It's not bios, but actually psychological 
And here's the deal. Obviously, a donkey disciple will certainly be willing to experience martyrdom. But that is once off. <laughs> but are you willing to have your soul recalibrated so that Jesus is the center? Are you willing to daily say, Lord, be the center? Be the center. I lay down my psyche. I lay down my soul. I give it to you. You be the center. You know, one of my favorite stories about Palm Sunday centers on the donkey. That on the Palm Sunday, the donkey is just enjoying all the adulation it's getting as it trots into Jerusalem, you know. I mean, wow, the people are laying down the palm branches before him and laying down the cloths and the robes, and he's just soaking this up. Oh, man, it's just really amazing. And he comes home and, and he shares with his mom just how amazing it was, how all the people were just like giving him so much fuss and attention and singing his praises. And so he's looking forward to the next day because he's going to go walk back in Jerusalem and just like enjoy this, you know. So he goes back the next day. But this time he's just flat out ignored. In fact, if anything, he's rudely shoved out of the way and shouted at and sworn at. He doesn't understand what's going on. Yesterday they were treating me so nicely and today I'm being ignored and shouted at and what else have you? And he goes back to his mom all dejected because that's what you do when you're dejected. And his mom just simply points out, don't you see, that without him, you're just a donkey. Folks, you know, the truth of the matter is that non-discipleship costs more than discipleship. And the discipleship that Christ calls us to does result in abundant life. So a donkey disciple, are you a donkey disciple? Is characterized by distinctively pursuing the path of peace and praise, by fulfilling their destiny through surrendering to the sovereignty of God through obedience and daily dying to the self so that Christ may be the center. Are you a donkey disciple? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we marvel at how Jesus declared the type of king that he is. And what a privilege for us to say that just Jesus is our king. But Lord, we know we tend to mess up and we don't always honor you the way that we should. And so we confess our weakness before you this morning and just humbly ask, Lord, that you would continue to love us and be patient with us and through your Holy Spirit enable us to be and do that which you have called us to be and do, that you would be glorified through our lives. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Shalom. Go in peace.